Good to be back here. It's been a while. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm the communications manager for Schmidt Ocean Institute. And today I am going to give a brief overview of the organization, a little bit about the research we've done here in Hawaii and elsewhere around the world, and some of the things you can expect to come up in uh, the next few months while Fall 4 arrives in Honolulu. So I'll just dive right into it. Uh, to give you an overview of our organization, Schmidt Ocean Institute is a nonprofit organization that was established to advance the frontiers of ocean research and exploration through innovative technology, intelligent observation, and open sharing of information. And we do this with our research vessel, FALCOR, which is our platform that we offer to scientists internationally around the world. We try to bring projects to our organization that are a little more cutting edge, uh, high risk, high reward, in the hopes that we'll advance science and that the data collected is shared on a global platform. Our organization is fairly new. Uh, we began in 2009 and we've been operating research on Falcor for the past five years. In 2009, we bought research vessel Falkor, which at the time was a fisheries enforcement vessel in Germany. And you can see the original uh, photograph of what Falkor looks like, a lot different today. And we took three years to outfit her with the state of art technology that is on board. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the tools that we use to explore the oceans aboard research vessel Falkor. In 2012, we uh, completed our refit and started sea trials. In 2013, we started our first full year of science. Last year, we were pleased to add to our ship uh, ROV uh, Sebastian, which is a 4,500 remote meter remotely operated vehicle, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the talk. So this is an image of Falcor here. Uh, she's 272 feet. We have a large crew of about 24 international participants, as well as 17 bursts for scientists that come on board. And so we typically go out to sea for anywhere from two weeks to 31 days. Uh, Falcor is capable, though, of sailing for 36 days at a time. And one of the things that makes Falcor unique is she's got some really advanced science tools on board to help researchers be able to better study the ocean. One of the things that makes Falcor unique is our high performance computing system. Now that sounds uh, like a mouthful, but really what that entails is allowing scientists that come on board the capabilities to do real time science. So typically in the past, Scientists would go out to sea, they would collect their data, come back to shore and analyze their data. What's amazing with the high performance computing system is that scientists can see their data and analyze it the day that they collect it so that they can make real time decisions. If there's something that they find that's unexpected or if there's something that they're not sure about, they can go back and investigate or continue to move on to a new area. And so this allows a lot more flexibility on board. We also have quite a bit of bandwidth, which allows us to live stream and, and have telepresence on board. All of our ROV dives are filmed and recorded live in perpetuity, which means you can go onto our YouTube channel and watch all of our live stream dives from start to finish as they're happening in real time. We not only focus on science aboard Falcor, but engineering and development. And one of the things that we are really interested in is not only looking at new research areas and new ways of researching, but the tools to do that. We've had several engineering cruises where we've brought several ro robotic vehicles on board at the same time. In 2015, we had seven vehicles deployed, autonomous vehicles at the same time on board Falcor in Australia and we'll be doing a continuation cruise in the beginning of January 2018 here in Honolulu. Some vehicles that we've had on board Falcor before is AUV Century from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Ropos ROV, which is a Canadian vehicle, uh, Nereus uh, there in the middle. We've also had several gliders and, yep, question? 
So that's a great question. Uh, so it depends on the research project and the scientists that come on board. We do not have any science dedicated scientists on staff. So scientists apply or engineers apply for ship time and they bring their projects uh, to Schmidt Ocean Institute. They go through a peer review process and we really focus on those projects that are more cutting edge or experimental trying new things. So that particular cruise was seven vehicles where they were trying to have them deployed at the same time using a map tracker so that they could have basically swarm technology to map a coral reef in a remote area off Australia. So that was that particular cruise and they're gonna use that same methodology here in Hawaii in January, 2018. And the, that's being led by uh, Dr. Oscar Pizarro from the University of Sydney. No problem. In terms of our own vehicle, I mentioned we recently built uh, an ROV. Our remotely operated vehicle uh, was designed and built under two years. Uh, its name is Sebastian and can go down to 4,500 meters. What's unique about this vehicle, it was designed to be modular so that scientists coming on board can put any instruments that they want to do sampling or understanding the systems that they're going into. The other thing that's really unique about this vehicle is that we have several video cameras as well as 4K cameras. So the video quality that we're getting from this uh, vehicle is incredible. And uh, I'll show you a quick video which just outlines some of the engineers that worked on building ROV Sebastian. So I think we're gonna work on getting the sound turned up a little bit. But that was our project manager, David Witherspoon. At the moment, we're passing uh, 1,500 meters to water on Sebastian, but there's a lot of data presented in here. We're monitoring the winch to make sure there's a winch to the speed of the winch, the speed of the ROV descent to the water column, and the concentrator levels, the water temperature, the oil temperature. We periodically look at those to make sure all those numbers are good. The navigation system is one of the most important systems we have on the vehicle. So when the vehicle starts to dive, they'll use the depth sensor and the USBL position to track the vehicle in the water column. The USBL is what gives us uh, positioning relative to down the wall, so it's like our underwater GPS. Then as we get side of the bottom, we start using information from the dock velocity log to track our movement across the sea floor. That's what gives us our most accurate position when we're working on the bottom. The navigation station is kind of the heart of the system for the interface between the scientists and our RV operators. As far as mining and gathering data, waypoints so that they straight for us to go down and pick up a rock or an animal, but we can know exactly where that sample came from, what depth, and what time, and what location. And we're not on the seabed, but we'll set on the seabed and then we'll pretty much let the capacity and get used to this environment and go through the set of technical and data. We'll use our science tools, 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 our blocks and features inside of our file boxes. And the last couple of weeks we've been doing some pretty gnarly stuff. We've been sending some 1,500 meter uh, vertical cliff faces that are part of our caldera. And we do that a couple of different ways. We ascended the cliff face, facing it, around some fog over the behind us, so we can be the and the last hand we pulled off that cliff face. But again, that's what we're from so that we can use that for data or conditioning science when we use them. Well, when you bring a new vehicle into the world, you need a team for wisdom. The vehicle doesn't work by itself. There's a whole team of people that kind of make it operational. It takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a whole ship's crew to drive this investment. So it's really exciting to watch the vehicle being built and tested in Guam last summer. Um, since then, we have had our first science cruise with ROV Sebastian in uh, the Mariana Back Arc region near the Mariana Trench. And uh, we'll be bringing Sebastian here to Honolulu for uh, its next cruise at the end of this month.
talk a little bit more about that. We've also built two full ocean depth landers that were used in the Mariana Trench. And in 2014, those landers were used to uh, do a cruise in conjunction with the University of Hawaii with Dr. Jeff Drazen and Patty Fryer. During that expedition, we found the world's record for the deepest fish, the ghost fish, at 8,130 meters. And we'll take a little bit of a look at that later on. Aside from working on the development of vehicles and bringing uh, different types of robotic platforms on Falcor, we really look for collaborative scientific research. So as I mentioned, we have no active sta science staff on, on our, um, in our organization, but we bring them on so that they can conduct different types of research. And we've worked in all the different oceans in all different types of oceanography. Things from mapping to exploring different species of fish to looking at air-sea interactions at the surface. The key things that we do try to focus on is science that is environmentally focused and societally relevant projects that have high intrinsic scientific value, and that also encourage outreach and student participation. We've had over 31 research cruises in three oceans in the past five years, and have conducted more than 530 science days at sea. As you can see, we have spent the majority of our time in the Pacific since 2014, and we have plans to continue our work in the Pacific through the end of 2018. We also focus on our community education program, and we do this through several different types of uh, telepresence, online education, as well as community-based research and outreach. We always focus on student education, trying to inspire a deep passion for ocean sciences. And we do this through several student programs that target different age groups. In 2014, we held three student-led cruises in conjunction with the University of Hawaii, looking at whale feeding behavior, mapping, as well as zooplankton ecology. And these three cruises had uh, graduate students from University of Hawaii leading these expeditions, and many of them have since graduated using the data that was collected on Falcor. We recently have developed some student curriculum with teachers also from Hawaii who have gone on board FAFOR, looking at lessons plans that can uh, that tackle acoustic mapping and multi-beam mapping as well as ROV video collection. We'll be hosting a training workshop with these student curriculums in October at the Waikiki Aquarium. And if anyone's interested in that, I'm happy to provide more information. We also started a student opportunities program several years back. And what that does is take birth of, birth of opportunity for students to come on board and train and conduct research with the science parties. And we've had a lot of success with this program, bringing students from all over the world, ranging from undergraduate to postgraduate programs, where they can come get some hands-on experience working at sea and conducting research alongside the scientists. Along with these bursts of opportunity, we also have an Artist at Sea program. The Artist at Sea program has allowed artists from all over the world to come on board, not only to conduct research with the science party, but to showcase the data and the type of science that's being conducted through their art. And we actually have two previous Artist at Sea participants in the audience with us today who will be presenting later this month um, so I hope they come back and uh, talk more about their experiences. The reason why we decided to do an Artist at Sea program is we wanted to see how artists would work side by side with scientists immersing themselves in the research and how that art could better explain or connect the public to the science being conducted on board. Since we started in late 2015, we've had 11 participants through the Artist at Sea program and plans to continue this through the end of 2018. We felt that artists, like scientists, are important storytellers and they help to see the science in different ways. We've had several uh, instances where our science party has worked with the artists and said they've been able to change their science by looking at it in a different way and being influenced by the artists that are participating in the research. An example of the programs will be shared later this month, but one particular example was a multi-beam mapping cruise that took place early this year in January. 
Um, this was also in conjunction with the University of Hawaii, led by John Smith. And uh, we had Lucy Bellwood, who is a cartoonist, come on board and do a comic book about multi-beam mapping. And for those of you from UH in the audience, you might notice, um, recognize some of the characters in the comic book there. So far, we've had 5,000 copies distributed to classrooms throughout the Pacific Islands. With the art that has been created through these collaborations, we've had a Traveling Artist at Sea exhibit this year, which started at uh, the Arts at Mark's Garage in Chinatown, and uh, since then has been traveling through to mainland USA for the International Ocean Film Festival in San Francisco, and then to America's Cup, the sailing race in Bermuda, Monterey Bay Research Aquarium, and we'll actually be returning to Honolulu later this month at the Bishop Museum. So we encourage you to come check out that exhibit uh, from August 29th to September 29th. And our final goal of our research program is to share the information that we collect. As I mentioned, everything is openly shared through uh, public repositories as well as on our website. We make everything publicly available from our sensor data to our live streams uh, to all of the publications that come out as a result of the research collected on board the ship. Our uh, website not only allows you to see where Falcor is, but shares daily updates and blogs, as well as our online gallery. Our live streaming allows people to connect with our ROV cruises in real time, and we always advertise when those dives are happening through our social media page, as well as connecting through our Ship to Shore program. This allows scientists on board the ship to connect to museums, aquariums, and classrooms around the world. Uh, this year, we held our second annual Tri-Ship Connection, where we co uh, collaborated with the Okeanos Explorer and the Nautilus, two other research vessels, and spoke live uh, to classrooms across the world. We also try to community in the science that's happening with a real-time annotation system. In 2015, we worked with the coordinated robotics crews that I spoke about um, to develop the Squiddle program, and we've been working on the Squiddle program ever since. The Squiddle program will be made publicly available shortly for annotation of live collected images of the seafloor, where students or interested public can go and help to annotate some of the images that are being collected in real time. What you're seeing here are pictures of the seabed floor off a coral reef uh, in Australia. Now what you can do is collect from the specific image the annotation of what that sea book, the sea flat, uh, sorry, seabed floor looks like with specific categories. We'll have 68 categories as you can see on the right hand side here. And all you do is click on a uh, assigned point by the computer program to help annotate what is being shown in the image. Those annotations help with computer algorithms that get to recognize the images and better learn how to autom automatically create those tags. This system uh, was tested in 2015 as it continues to be used and revised, and we're looking forward to implementing that on a 2018 cruise in January. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the research that we've conducted both here in Hawaii and elsewhere in the world. We really focused a lot on high resolution mapping of the seafloor. Oftentimes when you look at maps of the world, if you look at a global map and you look at the ocean and it's painted blue. There, but in fact, the ocean is not just a big blue mass as we all know. Most of the ocean floor is still not mapped in high resolution. And these types of maps are needed for important research and understanding of different oceanographic processes. We've tried to conduct cruises that look at being able to use these maps for applied research. In 2014, we did two cruises in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. These were led by uh, Principal Investigator Chris Kelly. We were able to map 35% of the monument that hadn't been mapped in high resolution before. That's about 7.6 times the size of the main Hawaiian Islands. And these high resolution, ma resolution maps were later used on other cruises with the Okeanos Explorer to better um, understand some of the fish and coral habitats in deep sea environments. 
these maps were used to be able to develop uh, dives and as a consequence were able to find new species. Another mapping expedition we did earlier this year was at Johnston Atoll, which is part of the Pacific Islands Remote uh, Monument. And this uh, expedition allowed Dr. Uh, John Smith to map areas that had not been mapped before. I'm not going to speak too much about this because he'll be coming back as part of our month lecture series to talk more about this specific cruise. And that will be on Thursday, August 31st. Not only are we mapping the bottom of the ocean floor, we've done several expeditions that focus on midwater and sea surface oceanography. And I'd like to point out several cruises that have taken place here in the Hawaiian Islands. The first one took place in January 2016 and was led by Chief Scientist Max Sato, uh, where Falkor sailed from Honolulu to Tahiti, looking at oxygen dead zones or oxygen minimum zones in the Pacific Ocean. This was uh, essentially a cruise to look at areas where oxygen is depleted in the ocean and how this is affecting small planktonic communities. They used a new type of analyst for looking at the water samples using proteins. And uh, we're still in working with Max Sato as he uh, analyzes a lot of the samples. In February of this year, we worked with scientists from NASA on a cruise that took place uh, leaving here in Honolulu, going across, uh, going north to Seattle. This cruise looked at uh, plankton and actually small particles in the ocean for helping to inform satellite measurements and development for NASA. I'm going to share a quick video that talks a little bit about this expedition. <laughs> There she comes many different colors. It can be brown, it can be gray, sometimes it can be red. And the ocean color is dependent on the particles and different the whole things in it. Uh, so we have phytoplankton bodies in the water, dissolved organic matter, sediments, all sorts of different things that can scatter and absorb light in different ways and change the way we perceive the color. So the whole uh, driver for the cruise is to be able to collect data that will help us better understand the imagery collected by ocean color satellites. Studying ocean color actually can tell us a lot about ocean. The changes of the color of the ocean are dependent on the processes that are happening in it. Not only are we looking at the color of the ocean, but also what's in it. So if we can establish a clear relationship between the components of the ocean and how it changes the color, we're able to detect this in satellites. It's really cool that we can get this like you know, wonderfully synoptic view of the world. We want to understand how much carbon is sinking out of the surface ocean. So we need to understand the biology of the ocean that's driving that. And we want especially to be able to interpret what we can see from satellites. And satellite image to ocean biology to carbon export. By knowing who's in the ocean, we can say many more different things. We can say how is ocean controlling the climate. We can also say how, how much phytoplankton will be there for, to feed the fish and other biotropic level. The third aspect is the production of oxygen. Um, phytoplankton produces, it's produced 50% of the oxygen that is currently in the atmosphere. Oh, we're going to be very, very busy. Um, we have a very adventurous plan in front of us, and, and if the weather cooperates with us, I hope we're going to get some really great data. So we're simply right now um, in the Oligotrophic Ocean, so it's part of the ocean that's dominated by very small phytoplankton. Not a lot of productivity, um, and I hope we're going to end up in the coastal California current, where there's lots of productivity. It's biologically quite rich. So if we can get lots of contrast, have everything work perfectly, then my so they're still working on uh, analyzing, analyzing the data that was collected on that expedition, but um, it was a very successful cruise. They were also able to use a holographic camera to do some 3D uh, virtual reality walkthroughs of the plankton, so you could actually see it happening in real time, and they have some really interesting um, imagery from that, uh, which will hopefully be coming out soon. So from the deep ocean mapping the bottom to the surface and midwater column, we also go to deep sea vent systems and hydrothermal vent systems. And we've done several cruises focused on hydrothermal vent uh, regions in the world. 
And event systems that we look at mostly have taken place in the Pacific or the Western Pacific Back Arc Spreading Center. You can see there, there's the pink dots there. But not all vent systems are created alike. And you'll see that different vent systems have different uh, species and uh, produce uh, vent chimneys in different ways. What we're interested in in these vent systems is not only the uh, biology, but how these vent systems are formed and how long they last. In these deep sea environments that don't have a lot of light or food or temperature, the hydrothermal vent systems provide sort of an oasis in these deep sea areas where you see a lot of bacteria and organisms producing food using chemosynthesis or the chemicals, the sulfides in the water. Now, the vent environments that we would see, the peripheral, the lava, and the chimney, most of the work that's being done is around the chimney because this is where we see the most uh, biodiversity as well as the active uh, venting and high temperatures. How we look at these areas by multi-beam mapping, which we've shown some examples of today. And this uh, map here actually shows a vent field where you can see to your left here, uh, all of those chimneys stacked over there in the corner. We also use photo mosaicing to look at uh, not only what is present on these chimney systems, but how they change over time. And the photo mosaicing uh, is used in a similar way to the squiddle program I just showed you, where you're essentially annotating and looking at changes uh, through these um, images also do quite a bit of uh, 3D modeling. We had a cruise in March earlier this year that went to the Laal Basin and produced some of the most high resolution 3D models of event system that have been created before. And uh, Tom Kwasnichka, who is the PI of this cruise from Guillemar, is working on these 3D models, not only to make virtual reality walkthroughs of these entire event fields, but making them available to the public. We also rely quite heavily on video observation. And with vehicles like ROV Sebastian and other robotic vehicles, we can take cameras down to be able to look at what's happening and observe in real time to be able to collect water samples as well as biological samples. We can also take with these underwater robotic vehicles that will give us more understanding of the water chemistry as well as be, uh, be able to collect some sampling for experiments, not only on board Falkor, but for genetic analysis back on shore. One example of our deeper cruises took place in the Mariana Trench in 2014. As I mentioned earlier, this was with Dr. Jeff Drazen and Patty Fryer. They used these landers to conduct research at 92 different stations at depths of 5,000 to 10,600 meters. Not only did they look at the biology, but looked at uh, the geology and chemistry of this area. So it was a multidisciplinary cruise. And they came up with some amazing findings from this expedition, including that the mud community, so the mud that they found in the Mariana Trench, was some of the produ most productive mud they had ever measured, as well as creating new records for rat tails and snailfish, as well as amphipods and the deepest rocks collected from the Mariana Fore Arc at 8,720 meters. Jeff Drazen will actually be coming here next, in two weeks, to talk about this expedition. Now, I also mentioned this was a cruise where the deepest fish was recorded at 8,130 meters. Uh, dubbed the ghost fish, this snail fish was found on accident when doing some core sampling. And you'll uh, see the fish come up in the bottom right screen there. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to see the ghost fish, it's always, I always love an opportunity to be able to show this video. It is an amazing looking fish. That's a great question. I, to be honest, don't know the official size of the fish, the dimensions. This, this big. <laughs> I don't think you'd want to eat any fish from 8,130 meters. 
So that's just a little sample for you. Now, one of the things that we're really excited about, um, and I am particularly excited about the next coming cruises because they're going to be, uh, Falcor is going to be coming to Honolulu in just a few weeks. And our next cruise that we have coming up is Unraveling Ancient Sea Level Secrets with Dr. Ken Rubin, who will be here next week to talk about this expedition. The team on board of this cruise will not only use an AUV, but an ROV, so two types of robotic vehicles, to explore ancient coral reefs to better understand uh, sea level here in Hawaii and globally as well. The cruise will take place from August 25th till October 4th, and you might get a chance to see Falcor um, conducting some of its work here in the main Hawaiian Islands, um, and as was mentioned, off Honoma Bay on uh, the AUV portion, the first portion of that expedition. They'll also be um, going outside of Hawaiian waters for this cruise, but what will be really neat is all of it will be live streamed, so you'll have an opportunity to see some of those ancient coral beds that they'll be looking at, um, if you're interested, through our website and our YouTube page. The next cruise that will be taking place after that one will be discovering deep sea corals in the Phoenix Islands. So the Phoenix Islands protected area uh, will be taking our ROV uh, Sebastian along for that cruise and looking at uh, also deep corals that in regions that have not been looked at before. So we're hoping to possibly discover some new coral species on that expedition. And finally, at the end of the year, we'll have our underwater fire cruise, which will go back to the Laau Basin uh, with Ken Rubin again as the PI, looking at some uh, hydrothermal vent areas as well from November 10th to December 17th. Now then we're coming to Hawaii, and that will give us an opportunity to see the research vessel in real time. Whenever we do expeditions globally, we like to engage with the community through presentations such as this and ship tours. We will have a public tour day on Falcor for those of you that are interested in coming to see the research vessel. Uh, we'll be docked at Pier 34 and we'll be having public tours from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m on Sunday, October 1st. We'll be announcing signups online, um, but just mark that in your calendars if you are interested coming out to Falcor to see uh, not only the ship, but ROV Sebastian will be on display and uh, talk to some of the scientists that will be going out on Falcor later this year. So just a quick overview of the next uh, presentations that will be coming up. As I mentioned next week, Ken Rubin, who will be going out on that first expedition I mentioned coming up, uh, he'll be talking about ancient sea level and coral reefs. Uh, we'll then have Jeff Drazen on the 17th talking about that Mariana Trench expedition and the discovery of the ghost fish followed by our two artists, uh, Michelle and Kirsten, who are here today in the second row, and they'll be talking about their work on Falcor and the art that they inspired on August 24th. And we'll wrap up on August 31st with John Smith, who will be talking about mapping um, the monuments that he did on board Falcor. Uh, a little bit about the cruises that took place in the Papahanaumokuakea Kamri National Monument, as well as the Johnston Atoll. So there are many ways you can follow Schmidt Ocean Institute online. Uh, our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds are pretty active, and we announce all of our tours, our live dives, and community programs through those streams. And that will see any questions. Yes. Excellent question. So our founders are Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Um, it's a family foundation, so it's privately funded by the Schmidt family. We are also not a grant-giving organization, so that means we do not give out money to scientists to do their research. We offer our facilities, such as Research Vessel Falcor and ROV Sebastian, to researchers through an application process. Uh, that application process takes place any every December, so any scientists, whether they're government scientists, university scientists, student, or late career researcher can apply for ship time. And that goes through a peer review process. We only ask for a two-page expression of interest. Um, through that process, we'll typically select 25 to 30 
um, expressions of interest and invite them for a full proposal. And uh, we'll usually take eight or nine cruises depending on the year each year. Um, and they're not uh, specific to any region in the world. We usually clump the high ranked proposals and try to, to come up with a cruise plan for the year. And we do that two years in advance. So applications for December of the 2020. It's quite a process. <laughs> Um, receive any government funding and one of the things about Schmidt Ocean Institute um, is that we're by any timelines because we're a private organization um, which really allows us to be a little bit more nimble in not only in our selection of cruises but how we conduct our research and where we go. Uh, we have a lot of international collaborations which you may not be able to get on a government funded vessel. Sorry, can you speak up? Yes, good question. So can you use our data to publish? Absolutely. Everything is, uh, all the scientists that come on board software uh, enter a project agreement saying that the data can be publicly shared right away and be used. So we actually encourage um, other scientists and students especially to work with our data on what kind of data set you're interested in, whether it's the mapping or the ROV video. Um, if you're interested in our, uh, what you can do is go onto our YouTube page, they're all there, and then let us know what data set you're interested in, and we'll have Miller who has all of the high resolution videos in the cloud and give you access to that. Yeah. Uh, so, depending on the science that you want to do, you would write that into your proposal. And we work very closely with the science party to make sure they have all the equipment on board that they need to conduct the research. And oftentimes, we'll bring equipment on board and rent equipment on board for the scientists. Um, for example, we do not own our own AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle, which is often needed and important first step for conducting robotic uh, ROV work. And so we will rent an AUV vehicle for the science party if it's needed. <laughs> 